Welcome back to part two of lecture three. As we were talking about, we were talking about this particular problem where it's rather complicated. The ion rocket is has a force applied to it that's a function of position. And I made some sort of lame argument about, say, if it were in an atmosphere or something like that, that it would make a difference. But the point of it is, is that it's that we've defined this applied force on this particular system as a function of x. And with the rocket problem, we had just one degree of motion one degree of freedom, and it was moving in a rectilinear fashion, meaning in, in one direction. And so that's the reason we're using scalars here, just to avoid complexity right. in things that aren't so important just yet. And we went through and found the solution, and we talked about the fact that you have a time of flight. And if you wanted to get to the position uh, if knowing the time, you have to invert this equation. And it turns out that's not quite so easy as it might sound. Uh, sometimes you can get the time of flight and then have to iterate to get back out what the final position is. But this is, say, a solution. Uh, say we have the applied force. This is what we're talking about, the distance. As, as the rocket moves along, the applied force changes, so it goes from 0 to 4 to 6 to 8 to 10 meters along. And the rocket velocity, uh, you see a bit of an undulation there. And the time of flight, as it goes a certain amount of distance, Actually, there's a bit of a drop here, but it's difficult to see. But the point of it is that the velocity does get affected. And calculating this you know, by hand is, is fairly tricky. And here we've used, used F1 as 2 newtons, F0 as 10 newtons, and then M is equal to 10 kilograms. All right. Now, if we say that applied force is a function of velocity, then it gets even a little more interesting. And this is probably a rare situation, but take, for, for example, the situation of drag. Or for that matter, matter, rocket thrust is is another example of this sort of situation. The thrust that the rocket engine provides in an atmosphere is is definitely a function of the velocity of the rocket with respect to the atmosphere, but based on the fact that you're changing the pressure, the ambient pressure about the rocket, uh, the rocket nozzle as you're increasing your velocity uh, due to just the fluid dynamics behavior. So let's see. Suppose that we say that the force and here we're again we're going back to vectors. The force is, is a function of velocity v, and so the function this velocity v, this all the applied forces here is equal to mass times v double dot. It should say not or v dot. Sorry, this is mass times acceleration, or in other words, it's force is, that's a function of velocity v is equal to m time derivative of velocity. Okay, and here we're making the assumption that the mass is constant again. Sorry about that. And here, let's see. Well, we have force is a function of velocity. We have dv over here. We have dt. Well, if we rearrange things, we can say that, all right, then dt is on the left-hand side. dv over f is a function of v is on the right-hand side. And yeah, sure enough, when you integrate. You can sort of see the method to the madness here in the sense that if you can rearrange things with chain rule or whatever in such a way that you have all the stuff that is a function of one particular uh, variable on the right-hand side, and everything else on the left-hand side, then you can make some sort of integration. And you can always do this at least once. There is a proof that's uh, really beyond the scope of this course that shows you you can at least get to that first integral and uh, find a result there. Going beyond that, that may not necessarily happen, but at least you can do it once, always. So we integrate the left-hand side with respect to time using the dummy variable again. This is initial time, t sub naught, and goes to time t, and tau d tau. All right, so that's just t minus t naught. The right-hand side, when we integrate it, well, that's the mass m, not a function of anything, times the integral of v naught to v of 1 over f as a function of v, dv. Okay, and this gives the velocity as a function of time, which may then be integrated. And then, so then we get the time of flight based on velocity. You can also do something else here. You can say that the, f the function of velocity is equal to mv dot, and then we can use a chain rule and say the mv dv dx. And then we can rearrange it because we said that f is a function of v. We can move this over down here and dx over to the left-hand side. So then we end up with dx is equal to mv, mv times dv, dv. And then, and then we put the f sub v down here on the bottom. f sub v is over here, isn't it? So then we can integrate with respect to x on the left-hand side instead of t. And so this is x naught x d chi. And that's equal to more or less the same stuff we had before. Notice that it's changed a bit, though. We have the mass m here, right? I've left it inside this time instead of putting it outside. But then we have velocity v, right? That's multiplied inside here. 
That's because we've changed how we're doing it on the left-hand side. And, of course, there's integration from x0 to x of d chi. Well, that's just x minus x0. Notice again that this is all in 3D. So if you were doing this in 3D and had a very complicated problem on a particular particle, you've pretty much worked it out already. So let's take a look at an example to try to kill this. Suppose that fv is equal to f naught e to the minus av, and this is really where we're talking about something like um, um, atmospheric behavior, where a and f naught are constants for this ion rocket, say. And so with ion rocket meaning that the mass is constant here. So f of v is equal to mx double dot f naught e to the minus av, that's a force, as a function of velocity, is equal to mv dot. And so the rate change of time is equal to m dv divided by f naught e to minus av, by rearranging here, right? And so m over f naught e to av dv is on the right hand side now, okay? And so then we know that by integrating from t naught to t of d tau, that's t minus t naught, that's going to be equal to the integration of all of this. Well, m and f naught, they're both constants. And so this is integration of e to the av dv from the v naught to v. And I didn't use a dummy here variable here again. Sorry about that. But in any case, we have m over f naught a e to the av from v is equal to v naught to v. And then again, we're con it's a bit confusing with that the dummy variable. But if we just be careful about it, we can see that we get m over f naught a times the quantity e to the a times the quantity v minus v naught. So then if t naught v naught, t the initial time and the initial velocity are both equal to zero, so the rocket's not moving at first, and when we say at first, what we mean is time is equal to zero. Then we get just a time of flight. Well, that's just equal to m over f naught a times e to the a v. Okay. And we can do a little bit of a rearranging in such a way that we get the velocity of the rocket, and this is very unusual. We can do this now. Okay, what we're going to do is invert it, because we say we've got the time of flight, but I wonder what the velocity is as a function of time. Well, we're going to invert it and find out. e to the av, well, that's t times f naught a. f naught a comes from over here, uh, divided by m. Well, the m was from the top on the other side. And then if we take a log of both sides, we get av, or v, equals 1 over a, log base e, of t f naught a divided by m. So that's the velocity as a function of time t. Then we can integrate this, and we end up with the position is equal to t over a times log base e, t f naught a over m minus 1. Or, like if you followed along in, the, in uh, two slides ago, we can write f of v is equal to mv dv dx with the chain rule, okay, and then we can work this out rather directly. And this is the result shown here. So it's a good idea to be able to understand how to do this uh, for for Newton's second law, these different techniques, for these, the forms of these different applied forces, uh, because uh, you can actually get a long way to, to figure out what's going on inside of Newton's second law. The kinetic energy, as we talked about in the first lecture, a bit. The kinetic energy is just a scalar measure of the physical motion occurring in a dynamic system. And we saw a bit about it earlier in this lecture, and again, we, you know, you're supposed to know this already, but, but for a single particle, the kinetic energy is just given in terms of the momentum, and this is, strictly speaking, the actual definition of the kinetic energy. It's not v dot v times one-half m squared or anything like that. This is the real definition. It's the velocity of the particle, dot producted with the, the infinitesimal momentum of the particle integrated from when the particle has no momentum to when it has momentum p. So when we're saying that the, the where for the case where the momentum is just mv, meaning it's not it's not uh, relativistic moving near the speed of light, and it's not quantum dynamic, then we get away with this thing we just talked about, one half m times v dot v. When we think about work, and then as well potential energy, as, as in addition to the kinetic energy, we can look at uh, what we have for Newton's second law. Some of the forces, uh, is either cap F, 
or lowercase f sub i summed over all these different i's. And the i is just an indicator of all the different individual forces. That's equal to m v double dot when we have a constant mass particle. Integrate both sides from, say, one position defined by r sub a to another position, r sub b, on both sides. So f dot dr, notice the reason a dot product here. Okay, so integrating from one position r sub a to r sub b on both sides with a dot product, r sub a is r sub b. Right. Now, if we look at this, let's look at uh, a trick here for a moment. One half time derivative of r dot r, well, that's one half r double dot dot product with r dot plus r dot dot product with r double dot. Now, this you can rearrange to be either direction, so that's r double dot plus uh, r double dot dot product r dot. Or in other words, that's r double dot dot dr dt. So, one half d dt of the quantity r dot r dot r dot dot product r dot I should say time dt is equal to r double dot dot product dr isn't it from all from what we derived up here so interesting of it, what I'm trying to do is we're trying to get to this point where we can say we can replace this with something different r dot r dot r dot dot product r dot is equal to v squared the velocity squared I should say so this is just turns out to be one half d v squared. Hmm. Notice that this is this up here. Now, as from our trick, we kind of went in and went in and found this backwards. That's because we kind of we knew what we were going to find from the first point. But the point of this is is that what we see is is that we put in. We still have the f dot dr. And you can, if you recognize this, this is work, of course, right? I'll talk about that in a moment. But the right hand side is integral from VA to VB of one half M D V squared. And you can use this as just say as a dummy variable if you like. It doesn't make any difference. And what we end up with as a consequence is is one half M V sub B squared minus V sub A squared. This is the change in the kinetic energy, isn't it? If we define that left hand side as the work done by the applied force F as a particle, and this is really the sum of all the applied forces on the particle. As the particle moves along the path from A to B, as described with R sub A and R sub B respectively, then this work okay, is equal to the change in kinetic energy, T sub B, minus T sub A. So this is the work you do on a particle. Well, of course, that's the kinetic energy of the particle when you're done working on it, minus the kinetic energy of the particle when you start it. Kinetic energy afterwards is equal to kinetic energy before, plus the work done on the system. This vector r sub a, it's important. Where you start to do the work is important. When you're talking about second year dynamics, high school dynamics, first year dynamics, you never use it. And here, you're going to use it because it turns out to make a difference in your solution. If you don't believe me, just wait. It's called the datum or the reference. For some applied forces F, it doesn't matter how you go from A to B. Any path does the same amount of work on the system. And those kind of forces are called conservative forces. And you might wonder, well, all right, how do we know if one force is, a uh, particular force is conservative or not? Well, if you say A and B are the same point, any path should, any path should work, so no path would be okay, too. So if we say A and B are the same point, and we follow this path or follow that path, it doesn't make any difference, come back to the same point, the work done is zero should be. If this is true, then then F is conservative. If this isn't true, then F is most definitely not conservative. Okay, that's the reason for the if and only if. If F is conservative, then this has to be true, and if this is true, then F has to be conservative. So, a little aside here, the amount of work done, if the particle doesn't move, there's no work done. And believe it or not, there'll be a case or two here, we see a bit later, but virtual work, where if if it doesn't move in a particular direction, no work gets done in that direction. Don't forget that. Okay. If it's not conservative, if the force is not conservative, it's said to be non-conservative. For, for conservative forces, we can find what's called a potential function, v sub r, and notice that r is a vector and v is a scalar. v of r is equal to minus the integral from r sub a to r sub b 
of f dot dr. In other words, this potential function is just the negative of the work. So when you do work on a on a body, it gains potential, okay, and we call that potential energy typically because this is also defined in terms of joules or whatever the units of energy. For non-conservative forces, there is no potential function. You cannot write a potential function for non-conservative forces because if you change the path, then you'd have to write a different potential function. It doesn't work that way. You must define a datum, R sub A, to define V sub R completely. This R sub A, if you don't write to R sub A, you can't write what V has to be. It's another little funny little property of, of the potential energy. In that, in that you can write what the force is if you know what the potential function is, V, right? F is equal to minus del V of R, or minus rad V of R, in other words. All right. So you write it like this in the Cartesian coordinate system, or in, if you use other coordinate systems, they're a little more, a little more interesting. Uh, a more valid property is, is that if the potential energy, or the potential function uh, A of R sub A is equal to, to this, we call it minus W sub A, and V sub B is, and R sub B is minus W sub B, then we can, what we can find is that eventually, if you go down through this and check this, right, I might have made a mistake, but the kinetic energy at position A plus potential energy at position A is equal to kinetic energy at position B plus potential energy at position B. So kinetic plus potential at one time is equal to the kinetic plus potential at another time, as long as all of the work that's done on the particle is conservative. That must be true. If you have non-conservative forces like friction, drag, things that lose energy out of your system, this is not true. There's a slightly different version of this equation we'll look at in a bit later. <coughs> Excuse me. Now let's look at an example. Say we have a particle of mass m that's sitting in here. Okay as embedded in a distance one quarter r from the center of a massless circular disk of radius r, and this disk can roll without slipping on the inside surface of a fixed circular cylinder or radius 3r. So if we go from, well notice that we define a datum here, go from the center of this big circle out to where it's at here, the outer cylinder, that's 3r, and this little cylinder rolls along back and forth inside here without slipping. All right, without slipping, and that I'll show you what that means in a bit. What we're looking for here then is the maximum velocity of the particle during the subsequent motion. This disk is massless. The only thing that counts is this single particle. Really, all we've talked about are particles. Later on, we'll worry about when the disk has um, a mass a bit later on in the course. Here's a closer picture of it for you. Now, what we're looking for is the maximum. All right, go back to one more slide here. Maximum velocity of the particle under subsequent motion. When you're talking with these sorts of things, very often when you see maximum or minimum, it's sort of code words for thinking of how to use conservation of energy. Starting out at, say, A, the kinetic energy starting out, the, r the, w the, the wheel isn't moving, but it definitely has potential energy. If you look back at this picture, it's not rolling yet. It's fixed here. But definitely the mass is above its minimum energy point, right? If you let it to roll, it's going to roll down to where this mass is at a lower position with respect to gravity. So it'll actually have some potential to do work, or it has some potential energy. So the kinetic energy is equal to zero at the beginning, but we can guess, at least, that the, uh, the potential energy is not. Now let's look, talk about the slipping. If you look carefully at the previous slide, you'll notice that r phi dot is equal to 2 cap r theta dot. And that's equal to v naught prime. All right, And v naught is the velocity of the center of this disk because of the lack of slipping. It's not 3, it's actually 2. It gives some thought to that. All right, Because we're talking about the motion of this point, not the motion of this point here. Phi is equal to 2 theta as a consequence of this equation, right? With phi equals 0 when theta is equal to 0, we'll define it that way. 
when the wheel is at the bottom position. So like this, when the wheel is at the very bottom position, then phi is equal to zero and theta is equal to zero. For general phi, then, I should for general theta then, then the potential energy is equal to minus mg times two r cosine theta plus one quarter mgr cosine theta, cosine phi, I should say. How did I find this? Well, if we go back and look, we actually can figure out how to find it by looking at the distance from our datum, r sub a, to where the mass is at, r sub b. The length here, right, in terms of dot product with the gravity vector, okay, look at your work equation. Work is equal to the integral from r sub a to r sub b, right, of the force, that's in other words, mg, dot producted with this dr, the change from r sub a to r sub b, and that's what we would end up with here. This goes to the center of the large wheel, and this goes from the center of the large wheel to where the mass is located within the wheel. Where is the maximum velocity? Hmm. Well, you have maximum velocity when you have maximum kinetic energy. You have maximum kinetic energy when you have minimum potential energy in this system because it has a conservation of energy. It conserves energy. The sum of the potential energy plus kinetic energy is a constant. T, T sub A plus V sub A is equal to a constant, and that's equal to T sub B plus V sub B at some other point in time. So if T goes up, V has to go down. And the more V goes down, the more T goes up, meaning the velocity goes up. The maximum velocity occurs then when T is a maximum or when V is a minimum. So if this should be a capital V, I should say, not a lowercase v, but the, the derivative of a V with respect to theta then, okay, should be equal to zero if we look for the extrema of V with respect to theta. If we look at this, then we can see that the potential, the minimum potential energy, occurs when it reaches a point of minus 7 fourths mgr. Try it out for yourself and see if you can find that. At the start, then the kinetic energy is equal to zero, and the potential energy, well, we can compute what that's going to be. That's going to be minus 9 eighths mg cap r. At the finish, then, and the finish is what we mean by whenever the potential energy is at its minimum, then we have the the minimum kinetic energy, or the, the minimum potential energy, and we still don't know what the minimum, the maximum kin kinetic energy is. So we can say that, all right, we can say at the beginning, kinetic energy, that's zero, minus nine eighths mgr, that's the potential energy at the beginning, A. At the end, B, the minimum, in other words, potential energy is equal to minus 7 fourths mgr plus an unknown kinetic energy. That's what we're looking for because we need to find what the velocity is. So rearranging, we get up with 5 eighths mgr, cap r that is, is equal to 1 half mv b squared because this is an expression for our kinetic energy. We're looking for V sub B. Where's the, where's the maximum velocity at of this mass? V sub B, sub B squared is equal to 5 fourths GR. We're getting rid of the masses. Turns out the mass doesn't make any difference at all. So V sub B is equal to 1 half square root of 5 GR. That's our maximum velocity. And sure enough, this is really easy to write down directly, right? Just by looking at the problem. So this last problem is a pretty challenging problem. Go through, there's several steps to look at to make sure that you understand it. One is to figure out what it means when we're talking about having a wheel that has no slip and convince yourself that this is really what it means. And don't just convince yourself, see if you believe it and work it out for yourself. Furthermore, the next step is finding what the potential energy and the kinetic energy are at the beginning time and the end time. At the beginning time, we know that the kinetic energy is equal to zero. Do you believe that? But what about the potential energy? There's something else we have to find. The reason we, we, need to f we can write something about the potential energy is we have defined what theta and phi are 
at some particular position of this wheel. And then we've gone back and said, all right, then V, if we define the theta and V in this particular configuration, then that's what the potential energy is going to be. That's what we mean by using a datum. And then we've talked about when the kinetic energy is a maximum, the potential energy is a minimum, because it's a conservative system. It doesn't throw out energy. And we've gone through and said that, all right, this is for the initial time, and this is for the final time. The final time is when the potential energy is as low as possible. And then we have a kinetic energy left over there. And we went through the problem of finding it. Go through this problem. It's really helpful to help you work on the, the practical problems.